it is true that when you have fourth century Christians who are wrestling with the doctrine of the Trinity, they're drawing from um, language and concepts from Greek philosophy and Greco-Roman thought and so forth. And that's actually, um, that's true. And they're doing some interesting moves with that. But that's also just the way that Christianity has always worked. Christianity is something that always adopts a vernacular. So it's something that begins you know, in an Aramaic speaking context with a first century Palestinian Jew named Jesus and with his disciples. But the New Testament that we have is already translated into Greek, right? So we don't even have the original words of Jesus in most cases. Like the Sermon on the Mount isn't the very words that Jesus spoke because he would have been speaking in Aramaic. And hello, everybody, and welcome to the Jude 3 Project. My name is Vince Bantu, and I would like to welcome you to the Bisra Podcast. Uh, and this podcast is a part of the Jude 3 Project, and this uh, entitled the Bisra Podcast. And what this, um, this short kind of mini series does is it actually explores uh, subjects and topics relevant to early African Christianity. Uh, and it's called the Bisrot podcast, which is the, the word Bisrot is an Ethiopian word or a Ge'ez word that means the gospel. And, uh, and, and we do that in honor of our African uh, roots and ancestry uh, and continuing the tradition of the African-American church and African church of expressing and reflecting the Bisrot in uniquely African ways and methodologies. And in this Bisrot podcast, uh, it is a part of the overall mission of the Jew Three Project, which is to equip the body of Christ and especially in the black community on how we can give an answer for the faith that we have or the hymenote that we have uh, in Jesus Christ. And especially answering questions that are pertinent uh, around theology and apologetics in the black community. Uh, and so in the Bishrop podcast, we do that specifically with answering questions around early African Christianity. And so we do that through a mixture of lectures as well as um, dialogue with other leading scholars in early Christianity and early African Christianity. And today we are going to continue uh, that with our title uh, with this particular episode, which is does is entitled Does Christianity Come from the Roman Empire? This is a huge question in the black community among Christians and among non-Christians in the black community. Uh, there's a common perception that that essentially Christianity is just a product of the Roman Empire and Roman culture. And so we're going to discuss that today. And I am very pleased and blessed to be joined by a friend and a colleague and an expert on early Christianity uh, and Christian theology, especially in North African context, uh, Dr. Greg Lee. And so I'm uh, I'm I'm uh, pleased to welcome Dr. Lee today, and I would like to just share a little bit about his background, and then we're going to engage together in a dialogue on this conversation. Um, but Dr. Gregory Lee is the Associate Professor of Theology and Urban Studies at Wheaton College, where he is also the Senior Fellow for the Wheaton Center for Early Christian Studies. His work appropriates Augustine as a resource for addressing contemporary issues of church and society. A resident of the Lawndale neighborhood of Chicago, he is especially interested in urban questions of race and class, which he approaches from a distinctly Asian American perspective. Dr. Lee teaches regularly for Wheaton in Chicago. He is a theologian in residence at Lawndale Community Church, and he served for several years as board chair of Mana Christian Fellowship, a campus ministry of Princeton University. And so, Jew Three Project, uh, would you all give a warm Jew Three welcome uh, today to Dr. Lee uh, here with me today to discuss this uh, this topic that we have uh, today? All right, it's great to meet with you all. Hey, hey, Dr. Lee, it's great to be with you. Uh, love love this project. Love you, Dr. Bantu. Oh man, you got it, brother. This man is good to be with you, man. And uh, we we we've connected to different early Christianity conferences and just being colleagues. And and I mean, man, I think we might be. I don't know. We might have. We might be two of the only brothers that have that 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 urban ministry and early Christianity uh, like kind of specialization. So that's. I was reading your bio and I was like, man, that's that sounds familiar. <laughs> you know, like, man, we 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 got a, we kindred hearts for real. Yeah, I remember the first time we met at a conference. We were just at the book table, and suddenly it was three hours later, and we were still talking. I was like, I'm hungry. Let's go have some dinner. And I think we're the only two people that I know that have exactly those kinds of interests, too. So it's, it's great to be here on this program with you. 
Oh man, definitely, definitely. Um, well, and and yeah, man, we just uh, it's it's also just great, man, to especially as men of color to be able to be in that field and to collaborate. And even you know, in this context, uh, we know that there's some similar, some different, but also some similar questions in the African American and the Asian American community just around Christianity, race, identity. And so it's just, man, it's a, it's great to have your perspective on this question of today. Uh, the again, the overall podcast, you know, being focused on is Christianity a product of the Roman Empire. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, Dr. You, Dr. Lee, I mean, you live in Lawndale, Chicago, uh, so you know uh, our community. And, and so you probably are familiar with the fact that uh, there's a lot of different religions in the black community uh, that have different claims and they have different, they don't agree with each other. But it's interesting that one of the things they do agree on is that Christianity is the white man's religion. Um, and that it is antithetical to black identity. And they all have some very specific ideas about early church history and the relationship between uh, Christianity, the Roman Empire, Constantine, the Council of Nicaea, all that kind of stuff. So we're going to get into all that today. Uh, and I'm just so glad that we can talk about that. But, but you know, maybe um, we for our first question, maybe we can just get it kicked off by talking a little bit together about how, how would we define or describe what exactly the relationship was between Christianity uh, and the Roman Empire in the patristic or in the early Christian period? How would we kind of describe what that relationship really was like? Yeah, so it's a it's a complicated question. It's an important question. And um, the, the thing to keep in mind is that Christian identity in the Roman Empire changes through the centuries, that it's not always the same thing. So when Christianity first starts, you have primarily Jews who are worshiping this guy, Jesus, as a Messiah, and it's understood as a sort of a Jewish religion. And so if you're a typical Roman and you even heard about what Christianity is, you even heard of that, that there are these people worshiping Jesus, you probably would have just thought it was Judaism. Then after a while, Christianity starts to take on its own identity, but people didn't really know what it was. They just thought it was sort of a strange new sect, some kind of new cult. They had some weird practices that they didn't um, that, that weren't familiar to a lot of Romans. And there are all these stereotypes about what Christians were doing. So there was this idea that Christians were cannibals because they ate the body and the blood of some guy named Jesus. That's for a communion or Eucharist. There are thoughts that they were um, very sexually immoral because they had this love feast, which was, you know, centered around the Eucharist. But when you hear this love feast and you're a Roman it sort of sounds like it's um, it's, you know, it's very like vulgar. Um, and very promiscuous in a certain way. Um, Christians are often called atheists. And what they meant by that, it's sort of a funny term, what they meant by that was that the Christians didn't worship the Roman gods and they didn't participate in all the things that went with Roman religion. And so it seemed like they were bad citizens and they're withdrawn. So that's sort of the first couple of centuries of the church. And um, you have you know, intermittent persecution in local areas against Christians, but there's no sort of empire-wide persecution of the, uh, against the Christians for a while until you get to the middle of the third century. So in the mid 200s, you have the Christians getting persecuted en masse um, under Roman emperors. There's a Roman emperor in particular named Decian, uh, who, or, or Decius who uh, attacks um, uh, uh, Christianity empire-wide. And then um, that sort of tails off for a little bit. And then at the beginning of the fourth century, you have another major persecution against the Christians. That's often called the Great Persecution under an emperor named Diocletian. And um, that, that's really sort of the big one. That's the one where a lot of Christians are getting hurt. They're getting tortured. They're getting killed. They have to give over their scriptures to Roman officials and so forth. So all the way up until that time, Christianity is sort of on the margins of the Roman Empire. And as it starts getting bigger and bigger, it gets persecuted. The big shift, and this is what everybody thinks about when they think about the early church, is the conversion of Constantine. So Constantine is the emperor of the Roman Empire. He becomes the whole, the, the, the sole uh, ruler of the whole Roman Empire, the east and the western parts. And he converts to Christianity in this very famous set of events where um, he's about to march on Rome and try to take it over against this rival emperor named Maxentius. And he has this vision of this cross or some kind of Christian symbol. Um, and he's told, under this sign, you will conquer. So under the sign of the cross, under the, the rulership of Jesus, not Jupiter, but Jesus, you're going to defeat um, your enemy in Rome and you're going to conquer. And as the story goes, he uh, marches on Rome. He defeats Maxentius at this famous battle, the Tiber Bridge. And then um, 
he uh, uh, at the Milvian Bridge uh, across the Tiber River, sorry. And um, then he starts instituting a series of pro-Christian policies. He establishes religious toleration and so forth. He elevates the status of the bishops. And then you have all these early councils and creeds that sort of come out of that. So that's just the big transition right there in the early fourth century where Christianity goes from being you know, an unknown group to known a little bit and persecuted to being persecuted in a very intense way. And then you have this conversion of Constantine in the fourth century and then the Roman Empire becomes more and more Christian after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I agree. I agree completely. Like, I think one of the things and we're, and you, we're already moving in that direction because we got to talk about Constantine. I mean, in this topic, you know, is Christianity a product of the Roman Empire, which, again, many religious communities in the black community would say yes to that question. Um, you know, we have to talk about Constantine. And, and, and but I just want to also echo something that you said that I think is really important is the persecution that Christians were going through in the Roman Empire. Um, I think that we have to underscore that. I mean, it, I think it makes it untenable to say that Christianity basically came from the Roman Empire when in the first three centuries, Christianity was often seen as an enemy of the Roman Empire. I mean, you you know, you mentioned how, I mean, I think a lot of, that's just such a great point that you pointed out. I think a lot of us don't realize that, that a lot of early Christian texts and a lot of early Roman that are non-Christian texts, they use that term as a as an insult to Christians, calling them atheists, which is crazy because mm -hmm. nowadays a lot of Christians call other people atheists. But that's what Christians were called, as you said, because they didn't want to pray to the Roman gods. So the Romans said, oh, well, you are you're ungodly, you're atheist because you don't pray to the Roman God. But they that I mean, a lot of times. You know, like you said, it was kind of some intermittent persecution, but a lot of times that would that would have been engendered by this sense that Christians were un-Roman or that they were anti-Roman. They weren't down with the empire. They weren't, you know, they 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 weren't saluting the Roman flag. Um, and so, how can you claim that this religion, uh, which its adherents that were in the Roman Empire, um, which is another quick point I want to make, uh, but its adherents that were in the Roman Empire were constantly being like hauled into court and being seen as an enemy of the Roman Empire. Uh, it just you know, it, it, it makes that untenable. But the other the other thing that I think is important to point out is the fact that Christianity, it, it did not only grow in the Roman Empire. It, I mean, it was not only in the Roman Empire. You know, yeah, a lot of the evidence, you know, after the I mean, you, you know, we a lot of times we follow we follow Paul missionary journey and, and, and we continue to focus on that part of the world. When we study early Christianity, we focus on early you know, theologians uh, that wrote in Greek and Latin and that were in, you know, North Africa or the Mediterranean, like they were in the Roman Empire. And, yeah, there was a lot of Christians there, but they weren't only in the Roman Empire. But there were Christians in the Persian Empire, and that was mm -hmm. the Roman Empire's main enemy, actually, for for centuries. And Christians were there from, as you mentioned, Christianity starts with Yeshua and with his followers that were in Palestine. That's the that's the borderlands of of you know of the Roman Empire. I mean, to use a modern analogy, like it, it would all, if we were to compare like the ethnic and racial and national dynamics of the ancient world to today, I would I would almost say that like Christianity was started by like like Jesus being like a Mexican American who was born mm -hmm. and raised in like Brownsville, Texas. And all mm -hmm. the disciples were like were were Chicanos. And and I mean it was it yeah it started with a culture that was in one empire, but that culture itself was actually in multiple empires. Because yeah the Hebrews were in Palestine and they spoke Aramaic, but they were related, and they, so that we're in the Roman Empire, but they were strongly related to an Aramaic speaking Hebraic culture that was just as thick going a little bit east into the Persian Empire across the Euphrates. There were Jews all over the Persian Empire. So Christianity rapidly spread all throughout the Persian Empire in the first, second, third century. And in fact, in the third century, uh, Christian, while, while Christians were being persecuted in the Roman Empire, they actually were living more freely in the Persian Empire. And they were, they were actually, some Christians were actually leaving the Roman Empire to get into the Persian Empire where it was safer. And we're talking about like modern day Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan. I mean, in the 200s, it's crazy. A lot of people don't realize, but in the 200s, it was actually probably safer to be a Christian in Iraq, Iran, and Afghanistan than it was in what's now Italy and Greece and Spain. Um, and so, but but again, so, and, and, then, and then again, I mean, you get into India, there was already Christians in India, way outside of the Roman Empire, uh, already in Nubia or Kush, again, south of Egypt. So, you know, just to agree with what you're saying that, um, that yeah, I mean, it, it, we, we just can't, we can't think of it that way, that, that Christianity comes from the Roman Empire. 
um, because it was, it was all, you know, it was all over the place. But also, as you said, um, that Christians in the Roman Empire were, were being persecuted. Um, but as you yeah. mentioned, you know, that that changed in the fourth century, uh, that, that, that changed for a, a lot of different places. Um, so, I mean, let, let's talk a little bit more about that, you know, because that's Constantine is a big topic in in the black community uh, especially when it comes to questions of religion and theology and all that kind of stuff um and again there's this concept that basically um constantine invented christianity that christian theology the belief in a messiah uh that's that's a god man that named jesus and he uh you know died and rose again for the sins of the world and all of that kind of stuff that all of that was invented by the emperor constantine uh, when he called for the Council of Nicaea. And basically the idea goes that that was in 325 and in the early 300s in general during those reforms that you mentioned, that that was the beginning of Christian theology and that it all just comes from, from him. And that's where we get this perception that's common in the black community that Christianity is basically just an invention of the Roman Empire uh, that subsequently has been used by subsequent Western uh, and European and Western powers to dominate and to oppress people of color. And so what, you know, so I guess let's, let's dig into that a little bit more. What, what in the same way, like to make it more specific, what was the relationship between Emperor Constantine and, and Christianity? Uh, how would we define or describe that relationship? Yeah. So there's debate over whether or not, um, you know, Constantine even had a sincere faith. So that's one thing that he actually is not baptized until the end of his life. But he does put forth a bunch of pro-Christian policies. Like I said, he, um, you know, he elevates the status of the bishops. He establishes religious toleration. He invokes Christian language and so forth. Um, and then one of the famous things that he does, um, as you mentioned, is that he calls the Council of Nicaea in 325, which is one of the places where the doctrine of the Trinity really gets hammered out and the divinity of Christ and so forth gets hammered out. Um, I think it's important to know a few things about Constantine, which is that, you know, one one important thing to, to, to realize is that he doesn't officially make Christianity the religion of the empire. So that doesn't happen until the late 300s um, under an emperor Theodosius. Constantine just promotes religious toleration and pro-Christian policies. And 325 Nicaea also does not sort of settle the doctrine of the Trinity there's still all sorts of debate about it for the next several decades till you get into 381 and the Council of Constantinople. So even just like the story, it's important to be straight that a lot of the, a lot of times we think that Constantine becomes a Christian, the Roman Empire becomes Christian. No, it actually takes a long time before um, Christianity is the official religion of the empire and it becomes socially and politically advantageous for you to be a Christian. So you have people converting for the sake of being more established in Roman society or becoming a Roman senator or something like that. Who is Constantine? Well, he's an emperor. He's not a theologian. And there's this big debate that's going on in Alexandria about um, Jesus Christ and who he is. And there's a figure named Arius who is claiming that essentially Jesus was created at a certain time that he was create the divine word was created by the father by the father's will. So um, it's, it, it's sort of creating space between um, the son and the father in the doctrine of the Trinity. And there's this big debate going back and forth between him and this bishop named Alexander um, of Alexandria, who is saying, no, the son is co-eternal with the father, which means that the father has always existed. And so the son has always existed. And this is causing a big problem because um, Egypt is a major source of grain supply. And Constantine finally calls um, a council of bishops um, and they all gather together in Nicaea, which is sort of near Constantinople. And you've got all these um, bishops come out and they hash it all out. So Constant what, what's true about the story you're telling is that Constantine's the one who calls that council. And it is a strange thing for an emperor to call a Christian council of bishops. It'd be like Joe Biden calling up, you know, all the bishops and the leaders of every mega church that you've heard of, of like Willow Creek and Saddleback and of the bishops of the AME and, you know, NBC and Kojic and all these other denominations saying, all right, you're having a big argument about, you know, predestination free will. Let's hammer it out and come up with something for this, you know, to, to have a unified position. It's a weird thing. You are starting to get this blend of sort of church and state, church and empire. The thing is that Constantine himself is not really a theologian. He's an emperor. He's a he's a politician, right? He he runs the emperor. Uh, he, he runs the empire, but he's not getting into the nitty gritty 
of um, biblical you know, interpretation of thinking about how to relate the son and the father. That argument's taking place by actual bishops, by people who are deeply immersed in the Bible, who are trained in theology and so forth. Um, figures like Athanasius, or later you've got the Cappadocian fathers, Gregory of Nyssa, um, Basil of Caesarea, um, Gregory of Nazianzus. These are the people who are sort of working out the doctrine of the Trinity. And you can sort of read their works for yourself and you can see the whole thing is basically just interpreting the Bible and putting it all together. And we can talk about some of the specific arguments if you want, but they're not just sort of um, lining up with Constantine or lining up with the imperial powers. Actually, a lot of them are exiled for their beliefs. Their political fortunes go back and forth. Athanasius, I think, is exiled five times because of his positions. And so it's sometimes advantageous for them to hold the positions they are holding because the empire, empire, the emperor will align with them. But sometimes it's not, and they're going to get kicked out and exiled and um, face all sorts of persecution. So it's it's not really a simple story of you know Constantine just says this is what the doctrine of, uh, of the Trinity is going to be, and then everybody gets in line. He's a politician. He's an emperor who calls a council, and that is strange. It is a very important new development for Christianity. But then you have the theologians sort of arguing it out, and they're not just sort of aligned with empire. They're they're holding on things on their own reasons. And you can look at the texts that they're interacting with, and they're pretty much the same things that we talk about today in terms of the divinity of Christ. Man, that's man, such great points. It, and I mean, this wasn't in our you know plans. So I hope it's okay if I ask a sub question, but I think there's a in, so many great points you hit on. But do, like, would you agree with me, uh, Doctor Lee, that? Um, you know, that the Council of Nicaea, like you said, it was a strange moment and and the divinity of Christ and all that kind of stuff was really hammered out. But would you agree with me in saying that? But that doesn't mean that that was the first time that Christians ever articulated that Jesus is God. Right. Right. That, that there were there were people, you know, for the first three centuries of Christianity, way before the Council of Nicaea. Right. That that believed Jesus was God. Right. You just, I mean, all you have to do is go back to the New Testament itself, right? So um, one of the very, one of the things to keep in mind about the New Testament is that it's coming from this Jewish backdrop, right? So it's these Jews who are starting to worship this guy, Jesus. Well, there's nothing more important to a Jew than that there's only one God, right? You only worship one God. You've got the Shema from Deuteronomy, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You know, love the Lord your God. Um, there's only one God. Um that's in the backdrop of everything that you're reading out of the Gospels, out of Paul, out of all the New Testament. And then one of the strange things that happens in the New Testament is that, you know, all right. So in the Old Testament, you've got this language of Yahweh. I am who I am. When Moses asks God, you know, who are you? He says, I am. Right. And this is this great moment at the burning bush where, you know, Moses is fearful. He's hearing the voice of God coming out of this burning bush. Um. In the New Testament, what you see is that the language that's used in the Old Testament for I am, for Yahweh, is now getting applied to Jesus Christ, right? So how do you take these Jews who know you don't worship idols, that God will destroy your people if you're worshiping idols, suddenly saying that God in the Old Testament is the same one that I just walked around with for three years? Mm -hmm. And you've got Matthew 28 that says to baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Suddenly you've got these three persons are mentioned as part of the one identity of God. And then Philippians 2, it talks about how Jesus was in very nature God, but did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but humbled himself, made himself a uh, took the form of a servant, um, was obedient to death, even to death on a cross. And therefore, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven, on earth and under the earth. That's language straight out of Isaiah. That's a reference to the Yahweh of the Old Testament. So you've got Paul using this language about um, Yahweh in the Old Testament and Isaiah delivering the Israelites. And now he's applying that to Jesus Christ, saying he was in the nature of God, and now he's in the form of a servant. And so that's the language that the early Christians are wrestling with. So by the time you get to Nicaea, you've got all this language that they've been wrestling with, and some of the terms aren't clarified, some of the concepts aren't developed, and that's what they start to work out over the course of 60 years in the fourth century. But they're working with primarily biblical data. They're working with the Bible itself and saying, how do we put all these pieces together? Because it's complicated to know how God can be one in three. So it's not the first time by any means that they're wrestling with the question, but they are wrestling with it in sort of a new way and putting some language around it that hadn't been there before. 
That's exactly right. I mean, one 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 way I often think of it is like Nicaea was not the first time that Christians said that Jesus was God, but rather Nicaea represents the first time that somebody Arius said that Jesus wasn't God. Because mm -hmm. I, I don't think I mean Arius is probably one of the earliest you know theologians to come out and say that Jesus was a created being, and there you know and that's his whole movement is centered around that belief. And, you know, there's I mean, there's other, you know, heretical movements that didn't believe in the Old Testament or, you know, they thought the opposite, that Jesus wasn't really a human. Uh, but there wasn't really, you know, there was all these different, you know, beliefs in early Christianity. But I think Arius was really one of the first major movements to say that, oh, Jesus is, you know, he's God, but he's somehow less of a God than God the Father. And that's that's really what's new about the fourth century. But but it's there's nothing new about the way in which, like you mentioned, Athanasius or his his teacher Alexander of Alexandria, there was nothing really new or or um, kind of uh, like um, inventive about the way that they were making the argument that Jesus is God. Because as you mentioned, it's already in the in the Bible. It's in the New Testament. There's already these very Hebraic ways of, of, of attesting to Jesus' divinity. And then on top of that, between the New Testament and Nicaea, you got like 250 years of, of theologians that are saying that Jesus is God, that, you know, Tertullian and Irenaeus and Justin Martyr and, and all of these other theologians that lived way before the Council of Nicaea already arguing and using words like Trinity to refer to that to that 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 um, that biblical reality of three and one. So, again, Nicaea is it, it, again, all you got to do is read the sources, as you said, to see in the in the Bible and these theologians to see that. Again, there, that this is actually just a continuation of biblical and also apostolic uh, Christian teaching in the Roman Empire and in other contexts. Another thing I love to point out, again, it goes along with what I said earlier, that Christianity was not only in the Roman Empire, uh, and, and but it was also in other places. And in those other places, they weren't really wrestling with the fact of whether or not Jesus was God. Christians in the Persian Empire, they had councils too. As you mentioned, it's kind of weird for a king to be calling these bishops. The Persian king was doing the same thing. The Persian Shah was calling councils and they had imperial councils as well. They even had them before the Roman Empire had theirs at Nicaea. So imperial councils was already a thing in Rome's enemy. Again, Chris, another thing that a lot of folks uh, maybe might not know, but if you ask any Armenian person today, they will be quick to tell you that Constantine was not the first, you know, uh, and again, as you said, it's questionable whether or not he was actually a Christian, uh, you know, because we don't know about that. Uh, he might have been down with those Aryans, actually. And so he might have been promoting, a, you know, an Aryan form of Christianity. We don't know. He's likely baptized by an Aryan bishop. So his Christian orthodoxy is in question. But he wasn't the first king to claim Christianity because the king of Armenia, uh, Tiridates, had already embraced Christianity as the national religion of Armenia 10 years before Constantine did, before the Edict of Toleration in the early 300s. And that was at the same time when Christians were being massacred, as you mentioned earlier, Dr. Lee, the great persecution under Diocletian. So at the same time as Diocletian, the Roman emperor is murdering Christians in the Roman Empire, the Armenian king claims Christianity as the national religion of Armenia. And, the, and they're lodged between these two major empires, neither of which was Christian. Roman Empire is killing Christians and the Persian Empire is allowing Christians to exist, but it's certainly not. It's a Zoroastrian Empire. And you have this Middle Eastern kingdom called Armenia that embraces Christianity as a natural religion at a time when Christ at during the greatest time of persecution. So again, it's already in these other places and they weren't wrestling with the fact of whether or not Jesus was God. The Persian church, the early Indian church, the early Armenian church, they were clear on that. So if anything, the doubting Jesus's divinity was really a uniquely kind of Roman imperial question or preoccupation that they were wrestling with about whether or not Jesus was God at, up until that point was a clear doctrine, was a clear belief. And then one day when Arius ups and says there was a time when the sun didn't exist, now all of a sudden it became a question that the Roman church had to deal with. But most Christians in the other part of the world were already clear on that. Yeah, so I I, I feel you. <laughs> That's a long way of saying I feel you, brother. That's I feel, and so you know, and so um, that kind of I think leads us into another question of you know, again, like as you mentioned, it, you know, there's the Council of Nicaea, but at the same time, like you know, people will point to uh, saying that there was all these other kinds of changes that happened, and even and even at Nicaea, you had this kind of unique language that was created. Uh, to affirm the reality that had already been affirmed for centuries that Jesus is God. But then there are two homoousios, and now all of a sudden there's all these kind of ways in which the Roman church is 
being influenced by the Roman Empire, taking on political structures, uh, ecclesiastical structures that kind of mirror political structures. And, and there, you know, there, a lot of people say that Christianity became highly Romanized in this time mm -hmm. period. And again, fast forwarding, it just continues to almost become meshed with European identities later on going into the fifth, sixth centuries and so on. And so that still exacerbates this idea that Christianity is a Western religion. It's a white man's religion that it, and, and that goes back to, you know, saying that it, it basically just emerged from the Roman empire. So, you know, how, what would we say to, to that kind of, to that kind of question, the idea that Christianity uh, even just the doctrine, the wording, the 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 liturgy, everything about Christianity essentially is just an extension from Roman identity. Like how 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 what would or another way of wording the question is like, well, to what degree was Christianity in its earliest centuries? Uh, how like how was it Romanized, or what was its relationship to kind of Greco-Roman or Hellenistic culture and language and 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 ideology? If that makes sense. Yeah. So. Um, I'd say several things. First, it is true that when you have fourth century Christians who are wrestling with the doctrine of the Trinity, they're drawing from um, language and concepts from Greek philosophy and Greco-Roman thought and so forth. And that's actually, um, that's true. And they're doing some interesting moves with that. But that's also just the way that Christianity has always worked. Christianity is something that always adopts a vernacular. So it's something that begins you know, in an Aramaic speaking context with a first century Palestinian Jew named Jesus and with his disciples. But the New Testament that we have is already translated into Greek, right? So we don't even have the original words of Jesus in most cases. Like the Sermon on the Mount isn't the very words that Jesus spoke because he would have been speaking in Aramaic, right? And the Aramaic words that you have in the New Testament, a lot of us have already heard them before. It's sort of like, Aloy, Aloy, Lama Samaktani, my God, my God, why forsaken me? Like, that's when you have those funny words in italics, and you're like, what does that mean? And they're so familiar that you already know what they are, right? So Christianity from its beginning has always been translatable. And what that means is that, you know, our doctrines are always going to be reflecting the culture that they are in. And what we confess is that God is a God of all people, but God also enters into the specifics of time and place and can incarnate himself in that context and communicate eternal truths through cultural forms. So it's not like a, a, a strong argument against Christianity that it adopted the forms of its day. Actually, I'd say that's one of the strengths of Christianity, that any culture is equally receptive to the eternal truths of God's word. Um, but there's a lot to unpack here. So, um, all right, does you know Christianity in its institutional form start to reflect elements of Roman influence? I would say yes. Um, and are there ways in which that Roman influence corrupts Christianity? I would say yes. But what you also see is all sorts of reform movements that are against that all the way down. So one of the main um, places where you see this rise in the you know third, fourth centuries is the rise of monasticism, where people are saying, oh, I'm starting to see a lot of um, cultural Christianity, where people are becoming Christian because they think this is a way to get material advantage, social advantage, political advantage, because it's more accepted to be a Christian. I actually feel like Christianity is getting corrupted in its institutional forms. And so what they do is they make vows of poverty, vows of chastity and celibacy. They make um, they dedicate themselves more to fasting and prayer and to tending to the poor. So even when Christianity gets institutionalized by the Roman Empire in a certain way, you have people who are saying, no, 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 this is going in the wrong direction, right? So, I mean, I sort of think of this as, you know, by the end of the fourth century, a lot of Roman Christianity is starting to operate almost like the Bible Belt, where there's like this fusion of Christianity and culture, where if you're not Christian, then it's a sort of a weird thing. And then you have, you know, theologians, including Augustine, are saying, no, there's a lot of fake Christianity out there. And we need to distinguish, we need to recognize that the wheat and the tares are starting to get mixed up, that you have people who are converting on false terms, and we need to make sure that people really know what they're believing. So even when Christianity is getting more Romanized, um, there's people who are sort of protesting that and are critical of it and are seeing through some of the, the trappings of institutional religion. Another thing that I would say is that... Um, all right, so we're talking about the Roman Empire and whether or not Christianity is basically a Roman imperial thing. And that often also gets tied to this idea that Christianity is a white man's religion, right? So now you're moving forward to saying, oh, it's just like a Western European thing. 
And there's a lot of reasons why we could complicate that picture, including what you've just been saying um, about the Persian Empire and Christianity and all sorts of places outside of the Roman, um, Roman uh, sphere of influence. Another thing that I would say is that the Roman Empire wasn't just Western European. It goes around the whole Mediterranean. So my scholarship is on Augustine. And I think a lot of people think Augustine was white, right? They picture him like John Calvin or Martin mm -hmm. Luther. I think he was like Greek or, or sorry, German or mm -hmm. French. Or, Looking or, like Santa Claus. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and I'm like, wait a second. But if modern day, the places where um, Augustine spent the most time are Tunisia and Algeria. Mm -hmm. right? He would have been brown skinned. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't have been black in the way that we use that term today, but he mm -hmm. was a North African. Mm -hmm. um, he probably had Berber roots. That's an indigenous African community. Mm -hmm. um, his mother's name was Monica, which was mm -hmm. one of the most famous Berber words that we have in the English language. Mm -hmm. um, if, if Augustine you know, were to come over to the States right now, he would not be considered white. Mm -hmm. Now he was writing in Latin and he's, you know, influences Western European culture and so forth. But if you look at Augustine, his skin color would have not um, been what you think of as white today. He only spent about four or five years in Western Europe. He went to Italy, but he was born and raised in Africa, went to Italy for a little bit, came back to North Africa, spent the rest of his life there. There's, to my knowledge, and Augustine wrote a lot of works, there is no reference in his works whatsoever to race. Mm -hmm. um, there, he at least not according to our modern categories. Mm -hmm. He might have understood Ethiopians to be darker mm -hmm. skinned. There's a few mm -hmm. references to that, but he never thought of himself as brown skinned in distinction from anywhere else. We have references to how he speaks Latin a little bit different as an African compared to the way that they speak Latin in Italy. So he's got an African Latin accent, but that's about language. It's not about skin color. So mm -hmm. it, there's a lot of complicated steps you got to take even before you go from Roman Empire to Western European culture and the whole history of colonialism and imperialism and slavery and race and all that stuff. So it's important to see the diversity of the Roman Empire itself. It was very mm -hmm. diverse in terms of, you know, background and ethnicity and, and, and skill and color and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, where I do think that Okay, so again, I work on Augustine, and I do think that there's parts of his thought that get problematic because he's working in an imperial con context. Mm -hmm. But what I think that typically plays out in is the way that he thinks about church and state, the way mm -hmm. that he thinks about political authority and power and issues of you know, uh, coercion and war and things like that. I don't see it really influencing his understanding of God or Jesus or whatever else. So it's important, I think, when you're looking at early theologians to say, all right, so there is this Roman imperial influence, but what is it influencing? And it's not necessarily their understanding of who Jesus Christ is, where you can trace a pretty strong line of continuity from the New Testament to what they're wrestling with. It starts to become more the political stuff. And there, I think there's reason to critique, mm -hmm. to say, okay, there are some things that went wrong during this time period that we need to wrestle with, but we've got to complicate that story and see that they're actually critiquing it even in their own time. That's a lot mm. that I threw out there, but that's several no, things I feel that you. To complicate that narrative. No, I, I feel you, brother. I feel you. Like, I mean, you know, and again, I think, I think, you know, you, you've, you've done a lot of work on like Augustine and, and a lot of, you know, kind of Christianity, you know, really in the Roman empire. And, and that brings out the, the great point that you made is that, well, even what does it mean to be Roman? <laughs> like, what does Roman identity mean in late antiquity? And, and what is that? I mean, as you've shown, it's a cosmopolitan, um, you know, very multi-ethnic, multilingual kind of context. I mean, you mentioned that North Africa from like Morocco to Egypt, that's also a part of the Roman Empire uh, and the Near East, you know, Syria and what we now call Palestine or, um, you know, uh, these other places, Asia Minor, what we now call Turkey. These are part of the Roman Empire. None of these places would have been people that would have been white by modern standards. Even mm -hmm. even a lot of places in, in Greece and southern Italy wouldn't be white by modern standards. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the even the Roman Empire proper and what it means to be Roman is a complicated uh, and also a, a nuanced question. Um, and then on top of that, like my, one of my areas that to bring, I think a couple as well, is again, I really mainly focus on Christianity outside of the Roman Empire. And that even like just kind of as a double whammy uh, to say, okay, number one, 
what do we mean by Roman? Because that's actually a very multicultural thing. And many of those people that we would call Roman would not be white, number one. And then number two, and on top of that, there were Christian contexts outside of the Roman Empire that also had their own ways of doing theology and talking about God. And they all were, whether it's Roman or whether it was Persian or Ethiopian or Indian, they all, or Armenian, they all had found ways, as you said, I couldn't agree more, one of the strengths of Christianity, of the Bisrot, as this podcast is called, one of the strengths of the Bisrot, the good news, is that it takes on the local language and frameworks of the people. I mean, we see that in scripture when John calls Jesus the Logos. Logos is not a, you know, a, it's not a Hebrew concept. It's not an Aramaic or a, a, a Jewish concept. It's a Greek and a, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a platonic, you know, uh, Hellenistic Roman concept. But even in God's holy word, God steps into the language and the frameworks of Greco-Roman thinking. And he does the same thing in other contexts as well, in Africa, in Asia, in other places. And he steps into that and it's the same universal bisrot, the same universal truth that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is the Logos, that Jesus is Elohim, that Jesus is Shangdi in China, that Jesus mm -hmm. is in Ethiopia, he's Exi Abher, right? And when, when the gospel came to Ethiopia, they used their language. And the word Exi Abher means the Lord of the lands. And in early Ge'ez text, they refer to Jesus that way. So they found their own way to talk about Jesus and to use their language. But it's all the same truth. It's the same gospel truth that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And so, and so, you know, and that's that includes European or, you know, Roman or Greco-Roman, Hellenistic, whatever you want to call it. We see it in the Gospel of John and we see it in Justin Martyr. He found ways to de de develop that Logos theology. And so the Council of Nicaea in the fourth century wasn't the first time that you had Christianity taking on Greco-Roman terms and concepts. And it wasn't it wasn't the first time God intended for Christianity to take on Roman and European and white forms. But he also intended for it to take African forms and Asian forms and indigenous indigenous forms, same message, but different cultural forms, a multitude of all peoples, right? Every nation, tribe, and tongue, Revelation 7, 9. But the problem with that was when in the fourth century, when now all of a sudden Christianity became to be seen increasingly, increasingly as like it can only be articulated through first Greco-Roman kind of concepts and terms, and then later European, and then later, and we're, we're still dealing with that now to where Christians of color are somehow made to feel that their cultural identity and their Christian identity are somehow at odds with each other or that they, they don't relate to each other. And that makes it hard. And that goes back to this fourth century because when Constantine converted, so to speak, that, that made it hard for Persian Christians because now they were seen as traitors to their empire. The Persian emperor was like, oh, well, if you're a Christian, you're down with the Romans. That's the Roman religion now. And so that, that was the beginning of a, of a problem and a crisis that we are still dealing with today where people have this idea that Christianity is white or it's Western, and therefore it is antithetical to any other non-white or non-Western identity. And this is a major cry. That's why it's so important that we're talking about this and to show that, the as you said, the gospel, the bisrot, it steps into and takes on the language of every culture and nation and tribe and tongue. And it's not meant to be imputed or kind of put in uh, like by somebody else's cultural standards, but it takes on the local language and culture. And that's, But that has been what's been happening ever since the fourth century, even though that wasn't the first time there was Greco-Roman theology or style theology. But as you said, you know, with Augustine and with other Greco-Roman theologians, there was kind of more and more of a kind of an oppressive or a Hellenistic centered way of doing Christianity. And a lot of my research is going into the Council of Chalcedon and how that was a major breaking point uh, because the, the Roman church said, well, this is the right way to talk about Jesus's humanity and divinity. And then they just exiled as heretics most of the Christians in the African and Asian continents which mm -hmm. were, were orthodox. They believed Jesus was fully God and fully human. They just didn't say it the way that the Greek and the Roman people said it. They didn't have the same you know, nuance between person and nature. They had different languages, different cultural concepts, but that that was the beginning of the Western church, or if we can call it that, or the Roman church, really exiling most of the North and East African and Middle Eastern and even Central and South Asian churches that were growing at that time. And so that's, and that's, and I think that's what the stakes that we're really dealing with. And you already um, kind of touched on that, but again, the hope and the encouragement for me is the fact that even after the Roman church tried to do that, um, those churches and those Christian communities 
that didn't stop them. They continued to grow. They continued to thrive. And the gospel continued to spread along the Nile Valley and even into West and Central Africa. It continued to spread along the Silk Road into South and Central and East Asia, reached all the way to the Pacific Ocean by the 7th century, even got into Southeast Asia, even Indonesia and Malaysia long before Europeans showed up. And it took on local forms. It wasn't the Roman form, but it was the you know Church of the East form or the Miaphysite Egyptian form or these other localized forms that had their own language and their own concept of doing things. And, and so that's where that I think for me, that's an encouragement to me, but also to all all believers, but especially Christians of color to realize that that Christianity has been among people of color since day one. And even and, and really what happened in the fourth century, uh, you know, that to me, that represents like an attempt on the Roman Empire and, you know, and subsequent Western nations to try to appropriate Christianity and to make it seem like they run it and that they decide what orthodoxy is or what right Christian practice is. And and like Constantine did at the Milvian Bridge, they assume it to be uh, the same as their national will or their national desires and aspirations. Um, but that doesn't stop the fact that the Bisrod is still spreading among the true Bisrod is still spreading among people all over the world and taking on local forms. And so, you know, you, you know, I, I just agree with you, man. And, 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 and for our last question, you know, you, you already, I think we're going there and touching on it. Um, and I think some of what I was saying touches on it too, but what, are, what are the, you know, I mean, you mentioned Augustine and, 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 and some of these ways that, that Christianity was in the Roman context, um, you know, was really starting to kind of uh, take on some of these like popularizing forms. And you have monastics, you know, many, many of which are from Africa, uh, you know, most of which at first were from Africa and you had people resisting that. But what, what are, you know, to bring it to today, what are some of the implications on this question of like the relationship between Christianity and empire and, and Constantine and all these things on today? Because obviously, you know, especially since, you know, uh, January, but I mean, not just then we have we're wrestling today with, you know, what what is the relationship between the church and the state? And and, you know, we're seeing rises of Christian nationalism. And what, if any connections do we see with that, uh, with the fourth century and what we're talking about in Christianity and the Roman Empire and what we're dealing with today and and what even like lessons can be learned uh, for, you know, those of us today. Yeah. So this is where Augustine's actually pretty perfect on the topic because Augustine's greatest work, I think, is this work called City of God. And he's writing it shortly after the sack of Rome, where Rome is pillaged um, and it's attacked for the first time in hundreds of years. And people are very... Um, upset about this or very destabilized. And there's all these questions that arise. Um, are we being punished because we gave up on ancest ancestral Roman religion? So Jupiter is basically angry at us because we no longer worship Jupiter. We now worship Jesus. And so we're getting punished for that. And so Augustine has to respond to that and um, explain why the sack of Rome is not the destruction of Christianity itself, why Christians have a different identity as part of a heavenly city and not the earthly city, so they're not destabilized by this. He's also responding to this brand of theology that comes from Eusebius, which is called the Christian Times, in Latin it'd be Tempora Christiana, that basically says the conversion of Constantine and then the conversion of the Roman Empire to Christianity is sort of God's culminating purpose in all of history. And so the gospel goes through to all the nations, right, before Jesus returns. And the way that's going to happen is, you know, the Roman Empire takes all the nations over, then Constantine converts it, and then the Roman Empire is all Christian. Now the gospel has gone to all the nations, and now the end of the world is going to come. And Augustine says, this is all wrong. This is all wrong. Because the Christian faith cannot be identified with any one people. It cannot be identified with any one nation or empire or, or people group, the Christianity is about the heavenly city and these people who live as pilgrims and sojourners, sort of like the Israelite exiles in Babylon, where they're not really at home because the world has fallen, but they live there as exiles and they have to make, make you know, the best that they can, do the best that they can with the situation that they're in as, um, as outsiders to this land. And so what he says is, Humanity since Adam and Eve, since the fall, has been divided into two cities. Um, these cities are not political cities. It's not like Germany versus Austria or something like that. It's two cities um, in a more spiritual way. One city is a heavenly city, which is hoping ultimately in heavenly reward, who loves God above self. And the other one is the earthly city that puts all of its hope in earthly reward and loves self above God. 
And the earthly city, because it loves self above God and it loves earthly above heavenly things, they're naturally going to be violent. They're going to be prone to dominance, trying to take over other people, empire, and so forth. And the heavenly city, because it hopes in heavenly things, is naturally going to be marginalized because it's not going to respond in violence and with the same kind of desire for earthly things that the earthly city is going to have. And so the, the Christians and the heavenly city are always going to be a pilgrim people. And that's your basic identity. Now, you fast forward um, to Christian nationalism, which I've been doing some reading about. And, you know, January 6th, the insurrection and all this stuff. All right. So what is Christian nationalism? Christian nationalism is this idea that America was founded as a Christian nation and should still be a Christian nation. It might have fallen from its Christian roots, but that's what it should be. And when Christian nationalists, who don't necessarily call themselves Christian nationalists, but this is sort of the worldview they inhabit, when they talk about what it means for America to be a Christian nation, they don't necessarily mean a nation founded on justice and mercy and care for the poor and the marginalized and you know true worship of Jesus Christ and all the values that Jesus embodied. What they mean is explicit, public, political, civic displays of Christian identity. This means things like prayer in public schools, or it means you know putting the Ten Commandments on a federal courthouse, or it means that you say Merry Christmas instead of Happy Holidays. It's public civic displays of Christianity. And um, Christian nationalists believe that America was founded as a Christian nation. Um, I was just uh, interacting with a scholar of Christian nationalism. Did you know that two thirds to three quarters of white evangelicals believe that the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution were divinely inspired? Like a strong majority of white evangelicals believe that the founding documents of the United States were inspired by the Holy Spirit. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is a big problem. Not, not all white evangelicals are Christian nationalists, but a lot of them are. And mm -hmm. the ones who are, that's pretty much what they believe. Now, I think that what this points to is a really important issue, which is how you tell your history and how you understand your identity. Okay, so you have all these debates going on right now about the 1619 Project, public school education, whether or not you can teach about the Tulsa massacres in public schools, all these laws going on, uh, all these state laws that are being passed to, um, to basically prevent conversations about race from happening in um in the schools. And what is it really about? It's really about um, our civic or political identity as US citizens and how it relates to the way that you tell the story of the United States. And the idea is that if you have a very negative story of the United States that spends a lot of time talking about Native American genocide or slavery or Jim Crow or Asian exclusion and other things like that, then you can't have a positive sense of political and civic identity. If you want people to be proud of Americans, you have to give them a proud history. So you have to tell a good story about how America's, you know, moral and powerful, and that's been good for the rest of the world. This is where I agree with Christian nationalists, and this is where I disagree with Christian nationalists. I think Christian nationalists are right that how you tell history really matters for your present identity. I think that history is very important for identity, where you come from, who your roots are, who are your ancestors. That actually really matters for your sense of self. I agree, these are very important issues to debate. This is where I disagree with them. I got two, two points of disagreement. One is that the narrative that defines Christians is not US history, it is biblical history. Mm -hmm. Our story is defined by the Old and New Testaments and not by the history of the United States because mm -hmm. our identity is first as Christians before you say anything about civic identity. We are part of the heavenly city and not the earthly city. We are exiles in the earthly city. We are citizens of the heavenly city. So the most important story for Christians is a story of Abraham, Isaac, jo uh, Jacob, Moses, leading all the way up to Jesus Christ in the New Testament. That's our story that defines us. That's where we get our identity from, the Bible and not U.S. civic history. The second thing that I disagree with Christian nationalists about is that I think Christian nationalists seem to think that to have a positive sense of identity, you have to have a kind of narrative of triumph. You have to be the winner. You have to be the most moral. You have to be the most powerful. You have to be the agent for good in the world. And what I see in the Old and New Testament is actually stories about human sin and God's grace.
Mm. It's a story of repentance, uh, of sin and confession and repentance, and then God's mercy and grace and deliverance. My identity is not founded on how good of a person I am. It's founded on how good God has been to me. Mm -hmm. And my identity in terms of the community that I primarily belong to is the church. Mm -hmm. And that's a story of sin and repentance. And it's not primarily a civic identity of political and military victory. Mm -hmm. So when we think about Christian nationalism, we think about the early church. And the early church are actually really wrestling with questions about Christian identity versus Roman identity. And Augustine's saying, your identity is as a Christian, first and foremost, you're part of the heavenly city and not part of the earthly city. You're an exile in this world, and your story is that of the Old and New Testaments. And I think we can bring that forward to today and say, in a Christian nationalist context, we need to remind ourselves that our primary identity as Christians defined by the Bible and not defined by U.S. history. And that allows you to tell the story of U.S. history much more honestly, mm. with much more attention to marginalized and oppressed people groups. And we don't have a stake in presenting U.S. history as this great thing. Our primary stake is in honesty and truth and care for the marginalized because our identity is not based on U.S. history. It's based on the Bible. So I think there's a lot mm. that the early church can say about contemporary Christian nationalist conversations. Mm. Amen. Amen. Man, I, <laughs> I I wish we could just keep going all day because, we, man, <laughs> this is good stuff, brother. You know, but we, uh, man, we got to start to bring it to a close. But. Man, I just I agree with everything you said. And and I think, you know, also, to you know, to just also agree with and echo some of that for, you know, the black church and black community. Um, I think that there is like I, I just I agree with everything you said. And I think there's some challenges, but also some encouragements and some resources that we can really, especially those of us in the black church and black community can really draw from. I mean, I think number one is that. You know, one thing I think about with, you know, early Christianity is that I'm encouraged by is that, as you said, Augustine was one of the first theologians to really parse out that relationship between like, you know, the earthly city and the heavenly city and and how, and the Christian's primary you know, identity being in that heavenly city. And he was an African theologian. And so we have a history, people of African descent have a history and a legacy of Christians uh, that are helping us to understand that that pilgrim identity, that sojourner identity that all of us have as believers, as you said, that we're not, that our citizenship is in heaven and that we're not tied with any one particular uh, nation or uh, national identity. That's not our primary sense of identity. Um, and so it helps us to have that honest truth telling that we see in the Bible. We see even, look at how Israel, puts itself on blast in the Bible, put its own Kings and mm -hmm. like shames them and talks about the jacked up stuff they did, but also how God is grace, uh, gracious and merciful. And that's the honesty we can have. But, you know, we have, we, I think that there is a challenge though, that especially those of us in the black church and, uh, and in the black Christian community, and I think other communities as well, that we have, we also have to be better truth tellers and, uh, uh, and really kind of speaking out against Christian nationalism and white supremacy and, and all these different things because honestly, sometimes people who are in our community that are going to these other religions, uh, sometimes a part of it, not, not, I'm not saying all of it, but a part of a factor in that can honestly sometimes be ways in which we as the black church have not spoken as prophetically as we need to, and even as we have. But again, we have resources, uh, and that's where the encouragement comes in, in Augustine, and even in the history of the black church here in America since 1619, that we have, I mean, the situation that we were brought here in and have been in ever since for four years allows us to have a mentality and enslave uh, uh, spirituals and enslave narratives and in black theology that developed, we were able to have a Christian doctrine and a Christian theology that is one of sojourning and one that actually speaks prophetically against the empire that has enslaved us and has wrought Jim Crow and lynchings and Tulsa massacres and, and George Floyd and all these other kind of things that, that, that there's a theology, there's a rich theology in the black church that we have and we can draw upon to a, to be able to express that 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 heavenly city identity that we had. that's what the that's what the spirituals were singing about was mm -hmm. it was saying heavens uh, to heavens uh, church I hope to go and because old Satan's church is here below and so this is this is the theology of Augustine and the theology of um, of African American spirituals that we can draw upon that will empower us to speak out against um, Christian nationalism because the other 
you know, part of that that we don't talk about is that it wasn't only uh, in the Roman Empire, but there was there was act. So all of us can fall prey to this. But in Armenia, even in Ethiopia, there were conquests in Africa that were done by Ethiopian kings. So that also helps us to not romanticize any one of our cultures or thing. But also remember that, as you said, that all of us are in need of God's grace and mercy. And so and, and I can talk about it that from a historical standpoint, that there have even been acts of Christian nationalism, even in Africa, way before uh, colonialism and in the Middle East and in Asia. And so all of us are prone to this. It's just that, you know, Western folks have done it on the biggest scales uh, and still are doing it on the biggest scales. My goodness, uh, two thirds uh, say that a document that denies the humanity of indigenous people and African people and women is divinely inspired. That's scary. Um, I did not know that. But but again, so all of us are prone to it. But, you know, uh, some of us are just doing it on bigger scales than others. But all of it gives us also a humility that all of us uh, we're a multitude of all peoples, and we all need to identify with our heavenly identity first and foremost. But also, we need to be diligent to own the Christian story and Christian doctrine in our own language, according to our own people. As you said, our history is a part of who we are now, and so we've all been overexposed ever since Constantine kind of tried to grab the reins, or the even the Roman Church tried to grab the reins of Christian doctrine. That that doesn't stop the fact that it's been a multitude of all people since day one. And so all of us of whatever color uh, need to continue that cultivating doctrine and theology according to our own language and ancestry uh, to understand that we're made in the image of God too. And the gospel situates itself in our story, but also understand that we're part of a global body. And it's not just for our people. And that's the mistake that many of the religions in our community are making. They're going to the other extreme and kind of positing a black supremacy that places black people at the center of God or the gods or whatever their beliefs are in the center of all things. And again, that's the strength of the gospel is that it both it both empowers and and speaks to blackness. The Bible itself says, "Black, I am black and beautiful." Song of Songs one and five. So all of us are affirmed through the, the gospel to express our culture and our language. And at the same time, we're reminded that we're a multitude of all peoples, and all of us have been grafted into Abraham uh, in that in that that he was a blessing to all nations. And so uh, anyway, but man, I <laughs> I just this is good stuff, man. And again, we we I'm sorry we're over time and we gotta we gotta start uh, wrapping it up. Um, but this is man, I just appreciate you coming, Dr. Lee, sharing your wisdom and scholarship. And uh, and before we go, I just want to ask you if you could share with the audience, uh, maybe folks that are connecting with you for the first time, like what are some uh, final words you might have, and also what are some things that you would want people in the audience to know about things you're working on, uh, events or scholarship, and just ways they can connect and follow some of your work, and just any any other uh, things you want to leave the audience with. Yeah. Um, in terms of following me, I've got no social media presence, so that's hard to do. You can email me if you want. That's how I like to communicate. Email, phone, Zoom, that's fine. I don't do social media. Um, uh, I'm working on a book right now that's tentatively called Christians Among the Corrupt, um, Augustine and the Challenge of Immoral Communities. So it's all about how as a Christian do you remain in immoral communities, whether they po be political or civic or Christian? Because a lot of times we have to wrestle with these issues of you know, the Christians around me are the ones who are corrupt or the church is what I'm disappointed in. So the questions you're asking are really relevant to the things I'm interested in right now. So prayers for that book. I've got probably another year before it'll be done. Um, it, it's getting there, but I still have some work on it. So prayers for that. Um, I think the last thing that I would say in terms of just the content is that I want to agree with everything that you were saying. Um, one of the conclusions of my book is that Christianity flourishes most amongst the margins. I see that in my personal life, in the community that I live in and where I worship. I see that in um, communities of Christian power, where I see lots of corruption in places where Christianity and political power, economic interests come together. There's something about the faith that just flourishes the most at the margins in situations of invisibility or oppression. And that's not to say that we shouldn't be resisting those things, but once you start getting too close to power, that's where things start to get very corrupt and you move away from the message of Jesus. So I think um, the early church is an example of where you do start to see the church get corrupted when people get too close to power. And I think the black church, you're absolutely right, is an example of what true faith looks like, that so much of the spiritual vibrancy comes from the history of resilience and endurance under the, the these systems of oppression, which we want to resist, but we also want to appreciate that um, great spiritual fruit has come out of the black church. And so that's why I love what you're doing. Love what the Jude 3 Project is doing. So glad to be with you today. 
Oh man, it's it's a blessing for us, Doctor Lee, and uh, man, uh, and again, so everybody be on the lookout for that book, uh, because that's this conversation, but in book form, which means it's gonna be richer and deeper and informative. So definitely uh, be on the lookout for Doctor Lee's book, uh, and definitely follow his work. But again, Doctor Lee, we just want to thank you so much again for being here today. God bless you, brother. Yeah, and and thank you all to everybody who's listening with us today. This has been another episode of the Bisrot Podcast at the Jude Three Project, where we are helping you to know, understand what you believe and why, so that we can give an answer for the faith that we have. And and it's a, a blessing to be with you all here, chopping it up on early African Christianity. Uh, we have more episodes, so stay tuned in. Uh, check out other episodes of this Bisrot Podcast. We have lectures and also other conversations on various topics. And so we. Uh, we definitely want to connect with you there. Um, and so until the next episode, we want to tell you all, God bless you. And thank you so much for tuning in to the Jew 3 Project. And we will holler at you. Peace.